Welcome to the city of Oxford on this glorious fall day. Over the centuries, this museum has seen any number of famous discoveries, lectures, and even debates within its hallowed walls. But one debate in particular remains ingrained on the public memory, and that's the encounter between the Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce, and Thomas Huxley, who met here in 1860, one year after the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, to debate man's common descent from the animal kingdom. And now in the 21st century, religion, and especially its relationship to science, is a topic that is hotter than ever. In just a short time, 500 people fortunate enough to have tickets will cram into this natural history museum to witness a historic debate on science, philosophy, and God. The protagonists are well suited to the task, professors John Lennox and Richard Dawkins. John Lennox is a mathematician and philosopher of science, and Richard Dawkins, until recently, Charles Simone Chair for the Public Understanding of Science. Good evening. Welcome to Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. Tonight features a discussion between professors Richard Dawkins and John Lennox, both of the University of Oxford. Now, this is not the first time that these two men have met. Indeed, they debated one another last autumn in Birmingham, Alabama. In that encounter, the Wall Street Journal said that they displayed rhetorical skills in the best British tradition. The theme this evening is, has science buried God? Now, there are three topics of conversation. First is the issue of science itself, gaps and faith and evidence and so forth. And then finally, they will move into the topic of morality and purpose. If there is no God, where does that leave us? Now, we'll give this discussion roughly 50 minutes, and then there will be a Q&A um, we will be collecting questions from the seated area right here and then submitting them to the two men on stage. This will take about 20 minutes or so. Richard, the question as we begin is, has science buried God? Well, which God? I mean, we could take Einstein's God, which is not really a personal God at all, but which is a sort of uh, poetic metaphor for the mystery, that which we don't understand about the universe. We could take a deist god, a sort of god of the physicists, a god of somebody like Paul Davies, who devised the laws of physics, god the mathematician, uh, god who put together the cosmos in the first place and then sat back and watched everything happen. Uh, and that would be, a, the deist god would be one that I think it would be, one could make a reasonably respectable case for that, not a case that I would um, accept, but I think it is a serious discussion that we could have. The third kind of God is one of which there are thousands and thousands of varieties, Zeus and Thor and Apollo and Amun-Ra and Yahweh. And uh, we don't actually need to go through all those because I've, um, as Larry has said, I've encountered John Lennox before and I know what he, the, the God he believes in, which is the Christian God. So we only have to talk about the Christian God. John Lennox is a scientist who believes that Jesus turned water into wine. A scientist who believes that Jesus somehow influenced all those molecules of H2O and introduced proteins and carbohydrates and tannins and, and alcohol and turned it into wine. He believes that Jesus walked on water. I had been accustomed to debating with sophisticated theologians and I come across John Lennox, who is a scientist who believes in all those things. In particular, he believes that the creator of the universe, the God 
who devised the laws of physics, the laws of mathematics, the physical constants, who devised the parsecs of space, billions of light years of space, billions of years of time, that this paragon of physical science, this genius of mathematics, couldn't think of a better way to rid the world of sin than to come to this little speck of cosmic dust and have himself tortured and executed so that he could forgive himself. That is profoundly unscientific. Not only is it unscientific, it doesn't do justice to the grandeur of the universe. It's petty and small-minded. And that's the God that John Lennox believes in. Well, Richard, uh, thank you for explaining so clearly, at least in part, what I believe. Um, I'm glad to hear you say that you feel a good case could be made out that there is rationality behind the universe. You said it's not something you personally accept. So you believe that this universe is just a freak accident. There's no mind behind it. And yet, here you are with one of the best minds in the world. So, you believe a number of things that I, as a scientist, find very difficult to believe. And we can certainly talk about my specific Christian faith later, but I confess to it absolutely. I think that there is a creator of the universe. He created it. But he's not just a force, he's a person. And we are persons created in his image. And you say that God becoming human and Christ dying on a cross and rising from the dead is petty. I think the exact opposite, it's not petty, because it deals seriously with the fundamental problem that I don't think atheism even, uh, even uh, begins to deal with, and that is the problem of our alienation with God. Of course, that makes no sense unless we believe in God. So, I don't know how we should proceed. Perhaps the best way to start would be this. As a scientist, um, we both believe in the rational intelligibility of the universe. I believe the universe is rationally intelligible because there's a creator God behind it. Now, how do you account for the rational intelligibility of the universe? Well, John, you said that I believe that the universe is a freak accident, which is the opposite of, in, of, of, of what you believe. Um, for many years, uh, for many centuries indeed, it seemed perfectly obvious that it couldn't possibly be a freak accident because you only had to look at living creatures, the sort of magnificent diversity we see in this, in this museum, and everything looks designed. And so it was clearly preposterous to suggest that it was due to any kind of freak accident. Darwin came along and showed that it's not actually a freak accident, but nor is it designed. There's, there's a third way, which in the case of biology is evolution by natural selection, which produces a close imitation of something that is designed. It's not designed. Uh, we know that now. We understand how it, how it happened. Um, but it looks very designed. Now, the cosmos hasn't yet had its Darwin. We don't yet know how the laws of physics came into existence, how the physical constants came into existence. And so we can still say, is it a freak accident or was it designed? The analogy with biology might discourage us from being too confident that it's designed because we had our fingers burned before the 19th century in thinking that, that biology, which looks so much more obviously designed, uh, that we, we got our fingers burned there. Now, in the case of the cosmos, freak accident or design, the point that I've made over and over again is that even if we don't understand how it came about, it's not helpful to postulate a creator because the creator is the very kind of thing that needs an explanation. And although it's difficult enough to explain how a very simple origin of the universe came into being, how matter and energy, how one or two physical constants came into existence. Although it's difficult enough to think how simplicity came into existence, it's a hell of a lot harder to think how something as complicated as a god comes into existence. 
difficult enough to think of how a deist God comes into existence, and even more difficult to think of how a Christian God who actually cares about things like sin and gets himself born of a virgin. Well, there are three or four different issues there, aren't there? there there's the question of what Darwin did and so on and so forth. But of course, as you have yourself admitted, as I understand it, Darwin didn't explain either the origin of life or the origin of the universe. And I would want to start there. You say we don't know how it came to be. But as scientists and cosmologists, physicists, we're studying it, and that very study and your own science assumes that the universe is rationally intelligible. 